joining me and thank you for hosting uh, for hosting me. It's, uh, it's my first time at uh, JFS. It's uh, it's a real pleasure pleasure to be here. I, I was telling the philosophers that I attended a uh, Orthodox Jewish day school uh, fifty years ago. The Clapton Jewish Day School in uh, in, the, in the Hackney area a, a long, long time ago. So it's uh, it's, uh, it's it's nice to be here. So um, you know what I'm going to say about inequality is uh, is quite unorthodox and quite outside of the mainstream discussion because what we're told today, really, uh, any newspaper you open up or, or any discussion on television or anywhere about inequality usually says that inequality, the gap between the rich and the poor, the rich and the middle class, the gap in pay, income, or wealth, that gap really is problematic. It is creating many of the pro problems that we have in the world today. And, and I've seen, in places like the New York Times, any everything from the problems in the Middle East to climate change to every economic problem that we have today in the world, all of them blame, in one way or another, on economic inequality. And I guess I'm here to tell you that I think, I'm pretty sure actually, that inequality has nothing to do with any of these problems. There are lots of problems in the world. Lots of social problems, political problems, ideological problems, and many, many economic problems. Certainly, many of the economic problems blamed on inequality are real. There's a problem of poverty. There's a problem of social mobility. There is a problem of some people making money who maybe don't deserve it. There is a problem of slow economic growth that most economies in the Western world, and the Western world here I include uh, parts of Asia, you know, a place like Japan and South Korea and, 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 uh, and Hong Kong, a place like that, that there's real problem of slow economic growth. The economies of most of these countries have dramatically slowed certainly over the last 10 years and really to some extent over the last 30 years. Growth rates in places like the United Kingdom and the United States are far less than what they were historically. All of these things blamed on inequality, I would argue. None of them have anything to do with inequality. Indeed, the opposite. Our attempts to solve the inequality problems are to a large extent causing slow economic growth, lower social mobility, and the institutionalization of a class of poverty. That is the, the, the kind of the, 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 the inability of poor people to rise up from poverty, which is tragic, but I think is caused by our attempts to solve the inequality problem. So let's talk a little bit about inequality. Um, so a lot of times this inequality problem is, you know, described as the problem of how we divide up the economic pie, right? We've got a pie, an economic pie. And, you know, like a pizza, big pizza, big pie. And the problem we're told with inequality is that some people have a big chunk of the pie and other people have a little chunk of the pie. And this is unfair, and it appeals to us that it's unfair. There's a certain element that says, yeah, there's something wrong with that. But why? Well, because when we're hanging out together, or when we're in a family, and somebody brings a pie, we all expect to get an equal piece of that pie. Indeed, I assume you all have siblings, and you often will measure whether your mother has carved out the piece of the pie exactly the same as your sibling, and you'll argue about who got the bigger piece. Because you associate fairness in that context with having the same slice of pie. And when economists and political theorists talk about the pie, they trigger this idea of fairness equals equal pieces equal portions. But there's a massive problem with this analogy or metaphor of a pie. Like, what's, what's different between a pie and an economy? What would be some of the differences? There are lots of differences. But what would be some? Just yell it out. You don't have to put your hand up. Just yell it out. Pies are edible? Well, okay, pies are edible. I mean, there's a, there's a sense there. What does it mean that the pie is edible? 
that it what? It will diminish. It will diminish. And what happens in an economic pie? It grows. It grows. So a pie that's brought into the home, baked, and now is going to be consumed, is in a sense a zero-sum pie. Right? Any piece that I get, you don't get. And it will be diminished. It will be consumed. Generally, consumption, consumption is the diminishing of something. Think of consumption as destruction. When you eat the pie, there's no more pie. You can't have your pie and eat it too. You know that one? Right? So consumption generally is destruction. So by consuming the pie, it diminishes. But in the economy, the pie is, in a healthy economy, constantly what? Growing. The pie is not static. And it's more than that. It's that you're eating or you getting a piece of pie does not come at somebody else's expense. Let me give you uh, a couple of examples of this. So, I own an iPhone, which is a pretty magical device. So I'm endlessly fascinated by this thing because uh, those of us who remember the days where this didn't exist and really think about it, this is magic. This is, I mean, I've never seen anything like it because to assemble everything that this thing does, 20 years ago, you would have had to spend tens of millions of dollars. I'm not even sure then you could have done it. You couldn't have. But we, you know, but I paid, how much did I pay for this thing? About a thousand dollars. How much was it worth to me? Is your first economics question. How much was it worth to me if I paid a thousand dollars for it? Uh, yeah, at least a thousand dollars. More than because if it was exactly a thousand dollars, I'd be indifferent. Probably stay home. I, you know, you can't really tell. So it's more than a thousand dollars. I can tell you, given how magical this device is, that this device is worth a lot more than a thousand dollars to me. And again, twenty years ago, I would have had to pay tens of millions of dollars to get what this does for me. Because think about, it. I, you know, I remember the days. You know, I moved from. I, I, I was born and raised in Israel, and I moved to the United States in my 20s, and uh, I would call my parents up about once every three to four months. Why? Because it was so expensive. I couldn't afford to call every week. They couldn't afford to accept a collect call every week or to call me every week because long-distance phone calls were really expensive. Some of us might remember those days. It was a long time ago. Today, I can video conference with my kids before they go to bed, read them a bedtime story from anywhere in the world. I've been to places like Mongolia, and I, anywhere, and I can do that at a marginal cost of what? How much does it cost me? How much a Wi-Fi cost? Zero, basically, at the marginal cost. Of, at the margin, the cost is zero. I'm already paying for Wi-Fi. The extra call costs zero. So this is the most amazing communication device Imagine, and again, 20 years ago, you couldn't physically do that. You couldn't do a video conference, no matter whether you were the richest person on planet Earth. You couldn't do it. So it's a communication device. What else is it? That's incredibly valuable to me. Just that is probably worth more than a thousand bucks to me. What else does it do? Information. What's that? Information. Yeah, amazing information. Basically, every piece of information known to man is accessible through this. Again, you couldn't have had that 20, 30 years ago. There's no way to get that information. Because of the web, and because this access is the web so fast, I have access to almost every piece of information ever produced by a human being in all of human history. What else? It's a camera. I mean, I remember film. You guys don't even know what that is. But these reels, you only had like 32 photos or something. And you had to really watch every time you took a photo and be careful. Now you can take 55,000 selfies and then choose the ones you really want, right? But it's an amazing camera. The quality is better than the film. And you can take an endless amount at, again, marginal cost of zero. What else is it? It's a paying I, device. What's that? A paying device. You can use it. A paying device. I can pay with it. It's like a credit card. I, can, I couldn't have found this school without it. It's a navigation device. It's got GPS. I remember maps. First you have to figure out where the hell you are on the map. 
and then how you get to where you're going? Wow. I mean, and, and you open it up while you're driving? Pretty dangerous. Now, tells you exactly where to go. And we've missed on one music. Just one feature. What's that? Music. Music, exactly. It's an entertainment device, not even just music. Every piece of music ever composed, ever recorded, is available here. I can not only choose which of Beethoven's trios I want to listen to, I can choose what performance I want to listen to, and it's available to me instantly at a marginal cost of zero. zero. Not to mention movies, books. Now, books are not at a marginal cost of zero. I have to pay for the books. But I travel now. I used to. I used to have to go to my library when I go on a trip and pick which books I would, which book I would take. I could take one or maybe two because they're so bulky and heavy. Now I can take a library of fifty to hundred books on my iPad or my phone and travel anywhere and pick and choose on which flight I want to read which book. In other words, the iPhone is worth a lot more than a thousand dollars. So when I bought the iPhone, Apple made money. Apple's the biggest company in the world. Makes more money than any company in the world. And I got poorer by a thousand dollars, right? That's the pie, right? They got a bigger piece of the pie, and I got a smaller piece of the pie because I gave up a thousand dollars. I got poorer by a thousand dollars. I need to take my jacket off because it's very warm in here. Is that true that I got poorer by a thousand dollars? Yes, no? No, why not? Because I have something worth more than $1,000. But if I'm an economist, let's say I'm Thomas Piketty, who wrote the book on inequality, then what do I empirically observe when I look at my bank account and Apple's bank account? I see $1,000 leaving my bank account, and I see $1,000 entering Apple's bank account. Apple got richer by $1,000. I got poorer by $1,000. Inequality has increased. And yet... I am much, much, much richer for engaging in that transaction. Now, the richness is spiritual, not material, not dollar-wise. And if, if I'm a more sophisticated economist and I actually measure the assets I got, then what do I value this asset at? A thousand dollars. It's all we know how to do as economists. There's no way I can measure what economists call the consumer surplus. That is the surplus value I got. We don't put a number on it. So at best, I broke even and Apple got rich. And yet, the pie was redistributed. I'm poor. You know, there's even a better example than that. Um, I, you know, I don't know. I, do you guys read Harry Potter? Yeah. Yeah. Read Harry Potter? Anybody read Harry Potter? So Harry Potter is, is, a, is, a, is a major problem. Because Harry Potter has caused massive inequality in the world. Okay. Uh, my kids were about Harry Potter's age. So they wanted to read all of Harry Potter's books. So I had to buy all of Harry Potter's books. What were they, seven? I had to buy three copies. One for each son and one for me. So three copies of Harry Potter. Then we had to watch all the movies. I can't remember how many there were, at least ten. And then we had to go like Harry Potter Rides and Harry Potter this and Harry Potter that. So I figure I spent $3,000 on Harry Potter. Which means I got poorer again by $3,000. That pie shrunk by $3,000. And what happened to J.K. Rollins? She became a billionaire. Inequality exploded. She got a big chunk of the pie and my pie grew smaller. And all of your parents' pies grew smaller because they bought you the books. Again, what are we missing? The fact that my life is better for having read Harry Potter. The fact that I enjoyed reading it. The fact that I had a good time discussing it with my kids. The spiritual value of having read it. My life is much better for, for J.K. Rowling becoming a billionaire. And I would argue that you cannot get a big chunk of the pie in an economic sense without enlarging my pie somehow. In a free market, unless you're a cheat, a crook, unless you're committing fraud, you cannot enlarge your pie without positively affecting the pies of other people. Apple making gazillions of dollars is only because it makes the lives of Apple consumers better. J.K. Rowling becoming a billionaire is only possible because she makes the lives of other people better. 
I mean, there are a few marginal in industries where you can question this about I don't know, drugs, not the healthy drugs, the illegal ones, right? Would be an industry where they make your life worse, but they get rich. But that's very unusual. That's a real aberration. 99% of wealth creation is created because we benefit from it, all of us. So the pie analogy is wrong first because it assumes a zero-sum game. It assumes that your gain is my loss. But in a market economy, your gain is my gain. You cannot gain unless I gain. You cannot make money unless I improve my life. I won't buy your product if your product is actually going to reduce my pie, going to make me worse off. I have no interest. So the pie is not stable. The pie grows, and the pie grows through win-win relationships, through the fact that everybody participating in transactions is actually gaining. So that's the first sense in which the pie analogy is wrong. But there's a deeper sense in which it is wrong. And that is that there is no pie. There is no such thing as wealth of the UK. There's no such thing as income of the UK to then be divided up between people. There's no such thing as one big collective pie. Your parents baked a pie. I'm assuming you guys don't work, so you guys baked a pie. I baked a pie. Each one of us bakes our own pie. <coughs> and yes, as economists, we like to squish all those pies together and pretend there's such a thing as an aggregate pie. But there isn't. Your pie is yours. My pie is mine. Her pie is hers. Who the hell are you to take my pie and to squish it all together to create a bigger pie? It's mine. I created it. In a, again, in a market economy, you work, you get paid, or you create a business, you, get, you make money. That is your pie that you are creating. You're not redistributing. You're not taking from other people. You are literally creating wealth. And for those who don't believe wealth is created, all you have to do is compare the world in which we live in right now to the world in which we lived in 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago. And there's no comparison. For 100,000 years, for 100,000 years, human beings lived on about $2 a day. You know what $2 a day is? None of us can imagine living on $2 a day. I'm talking about today's dollars. You couldn't imagine living that poor. It's called extreme poverty. Basically, 95 to 99% of humanity for 100,000 years lived on the, on, the, on the equivalence of $2 a day. And then over the last 200 years, we have gone from $200 to from $2 a day to unimaginable wealth. Not just material, we're much richer than $2 a day, but spiritual in terms of the stuff that enables us to gain values but again, unimaginable, 200 years. We are so much wealthier than our ancestors are. It is hard to concretize. It is hard to make real. And it's not just here. If you look at the world, how many people today, so 250 years ago, 90 plus percent of the world lived at two bucks, two dollars a day or less. How many people today in the world live on two dollars a day or less? What the United Nations calls extreme poverty. It's about 3 billion. I want a percentage. I mean, I can do the percentages of my math, 3 divided by 8, but let's do percentages so I don't have to do math. So that, that would be what? 30, 40%? Yeah. Okay, 30, 40%. Do I, do I have any other, other guesses? 5%. What's that? 5%. 5%. We got 5 and, and 40. 5.1. 5.1. Right. You're not getting a price for who's closest. So, uh, 9.6. 9.6. Wow. I've never gotten such specificity in my life. Um, what's that? No, okay. They're, they're, gaming, they're gaming the system. Uh, 
30 years ago, 30 years ago, you were right in the sense that it was about 30% of, uh, of people in the world were living on uh, $2 a day or less. Today, it's 8%. 8% of the world population today, so whoever said, yeah, that, was me. that was you, okay. <laughs> you were right. 8% of the world population, somewhere around 8% of the world population lives on $2 a day or less. Extreme poverty is almost being eradicated from the world. Not at anybody's expense. That's just an increase in wealth. We're just wealthier as a world. It's just grown. The pie is exploding. And the pie explodes when you let individuals bake their own pie. So the idea of collectivizing the pie and then giving it up is a works against the actual growing the pie. Growing the pie depends on people being able to own what they make, to keep what they do, what they make, and to invest it and produce from. If you think about when this transition happened between between two dollars a day or less and the beginning of growth, by the way. Forever, with a few exceptions and civilizations here and there, generally, the idea of economic progress was unknown to human beings. You basically, children got exactly the same as their parents, usually a little less, because the more children you had, the more you had to divvy up the property among the children. That didn't work, that, you know, wasn't as bad as it seemed, because even though people had a lot of children, most of them died. So it's not just wealth that has increased. Think about life expectancy. What was life expectancy 200 years ago in England? A relatively advanced place. In 1800, what was life expectancy? Yeah, it was 39. 39. You guys are probably going to live well into your 90s. There's a good chance you live well into your 100s. If science and technology advance, you could live into well into the 100s. Right? 120 is a, is a nice number. And it's become... And it's become realistic. It used to be just a wish, a whim. Now it's become realistic, scientifically. And yet, not that long ago, 39 was the max. Partially 39, why? Because how many kids made it to age 10? What percentage of children died before the age of 10? A lot. 50? Half of children died before the age of 10? Pre-industrial revolution? Life was difficult. You know, today we take for granted, walk into a room, flip a switch, and there's light. Before electricity, where do we get light from? Candles. Candles or, or little lamps. What fueled the lamp? Oil. Oil in the late 19th century. What fueled the lamp before the, 19th, before the late 19th century? Well, kerosene is oil, and kerosene was only invented in like 1850. There's no kerosene before 1850. Before 1850, oil is considered, you know, if you had oil in your land, your land was worthless because you couldn't grow anything on it. Oil was only, became a value to human beings because of science and after 1850 or so, 1840. What fueled the lamps before that? What do you know? What was the oil that they put in the lamps? Oil to fuel. What's that? Olive oil. Olive oil. Way back, maybe yes, in the in the, in, 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 the, in the middle in the Mediterranean in, in the West, whale oil. So for a long time, it was whale oil, and one of the reasons the whaling industry was so big in the 18th century and the early part of the 19th century is because whales were killed in mass, not to, not for food, for the oil, because it was an incredibly efficient way of lighting lanterns. Indeed, kerosene. It's probably what saved the whales, because once we had kerosene, once we had oil, we stopped hunting whales in such large numbers as we did before that. But how many people could afford whale? Very few. Like the, 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 the aristocrats could afford whale. Everybody else lived in darkness. You got, you basically went out, you worked, when you went to work when the sun rose in your fall, you went to bed when the sun set because there was nothing to do afterwards. You couldn't read. No TV, no iPhones, nothing. So what was the transition between that kind of life 
and the life we have today, a life of wealth and, you know, and long life, wealth and health. What was the transition? When do you think that changed? The Industrial Revolution. When would the Industrial Revolution start? 1850 is a little late. When would you say the Industrial Revolution starts? 1750s. What's that? 1750s. Yeah, so somewhere between 1750 and 1850 is when you start seeing a dramatic increase, both in life expectancy, quality of life, and in wealth creation. And income starts going up dramatically. Anybody, you know, anybody have a particular year between 1850 and 1750? I mean, I have my favorite year right in between it. What was that? 1763. 1763. I, I don't know what happened in 1763, so it's not my favorite year. My favorite year is, and I know the Brits don't like this, my favorite year is 1776. And there are three reasons why 1776, I think, is a crucial year in human history. And really the year in which our lives become dramatically better. Three things happen. One, it's the year in which the steam engine is first commercialized. So you get the first application of a steam engine in a factory in a way that actually produces stuff. So you get the beginning of an industrial revolution. Second, there's a famous book published in 1776. Yes. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith which is really the first book that systematizes our exploration and understanding of economics and presents a certain view of economics that basically says markets work. And if you leave people free to produce and to trade, importantly, then good things happen. <coughs> Economies grow, production happens, and good stuff happens if you leave people that, if you give people that freedom and you don't try to intervene, and you don't try to centrally plan, and you don't try to control, then markets work. That was Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations, which if anybody's interested in economics or the history of thought, an important book to read. And what's the third thing that happens in 1776, maybe the most famous of the three? America. The Declaration of Independence, which, in spite of the idea that it's basically a repudiation of Britain, is much more than that, because the Declaration of Independence is really a universal document. It is not, I believe, a specifically American document, and indeed, the way it's written, it's written in universalist language. It says that all men are what? Are created what? Equal. Equal. For the first time in human history, a political document actually says they're all equal, not equal in outcome. Equal in what? Opportunity. Not in opportunities, because opportunities are just another form of outcome. We're equal before the law. We're equal in rights. We're equal in our liberties and our freedoms. You're not different if you're born to family A versus family B. Now, granted, the founding fathers of America were very inconsistent, so they didn't practice what they preached, right? They had slavery. But I, the idea of created equal, is it doesn't matter what skin color you have. It doesn't matter what gender you have. You are equal. All men are created equal. That is the idea behind the Declaration of Independence. And it's an idea behind the entire intellectual movement that led to the Declaration of Independence, which is what? What, what was the intellectual movement of the 18th century? Enlightenment. The Enlightenment. I mean, the Enlightenment is about equality. It's about the, the pulling down of aristocracy. It's about the pulling down of hierarchies. Hierarchies that are imposed on us by the law. It's about individual freedom. It's about the individual's freedom to pursue your own life. And indeed, the Declaration Against State, that's not in terms of America, but in terms of human beings. Every human being has an inalienable right. Inalienable right to what? What does inalienable mean first? Can be removed, cannot be taken away from. Have a right to what? It says uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So you have a right to your own life. Your life does not belong to a king. It does not belong to the state. It does not belong to a tribe. It does not belong to some entity outside of you. Your life is yours. 
to live based on your own judgment, not based on other people's authority or other people's coercion or other people's force. They cannot force you to do what you do not want to do. Again, these are the ideals. Unfortunately, never fully practiced. And you have a right to liberty. What does liberty mean in this context? It's really the freedom to think, the freedom to speak, the freedom to write. This is the idea of free speech, which again comes out of the Enlightenment. And you have a right to pursue your own happiness, to pursue your own success as a human being, based again on your values, on your individual interests, not to be forced, not to be dictated. It is a statement of individual freedom. The freedom of an individual to live his life as he sees fit, where the government protects you, but doesn't rule you. Where your life belongs to you, not to the state, not to others, but to yourself. It is that idea, as expressed in the Declaration of Independence, as a consequence of the Enlightenment, that leads to the wealth and prosperity that we have today. It unleashed individual entrepreneurs, individual thinkers, individual artists, individuals to go out and create and make and build and do things that nobody could imagine was possible without asking for permission, without getting a stamp of approval, without asking the leaders if it was okay or not to go and invent something new, to go to build something, to trade freely. What led to where we are today in terms of the wealth and prosperity we have is freedom. The freedom of the individual to act on his own behalf. Building, creating, trading with whomever he wants. And that freedom creates inequality. When we're unfree, we're equal. We're all equally poor and miserable. And every society that has attempted to bring about equality has led to nothing but poverty and misery. When you take a group of people, any group of people, and you set them free, they will be unequal. <coughs> Partially it's because, of, to a large extent, it's the choices we make, right? Life's not about money, which is quite shocking. But it's not about money. Many of us make choices that are against our economic well-being. For example, some of us choose to be teachers. Most of us are pretty smart. Could have done a lot of other things in life. Could have made a lot of money. I happen to have a PhD in finance. I could have gone to work on Wall Street. Could have made tons of money, millions of dollars. But the fact is, I don't want the millions of dollars. You couldn't bribe me to stop doing what I'm doing right now. I love this. This is fun. This is what I live for, right? And most of your teachers love teaching. They don't do it for the money. <laughs> they know that that's not a path to wealth. So we've chosen to be less economically successful than other people who've gone off to make iPads or, or invent new things or be entrepreneurs that are, or, or to work in the, in the city. We're all different. We're all different. And that's a beautiful thing. It would be a really, really boring world if we were all the same. We're all different. We have different values, different passions, different interests, different motivations. If you put us all on a desert island, we'll do different things. And if you come back five years later on that desert island, people will have different levels of what you would consider wealth. Who cares? Is that a bad thing? just means that we've made different choices. So what? Now, it's true that some of the reasons that we're going to produce differently are beyond our control. Our background, our starting points. But you don't fix that by harming people who don't have that starting point. So I don't believe you use force in order to correct, supposedly correct, inequalities. Inequality is part of life. 
the solution to the problems we have today, which are real, is not to try to resolve some pretense of inequality. The solution is more freedom. It's always worked. The more freedom we have, the more wealth is created, the better off people are. If you look at societies that have large social mobility, they're the freest societies. The more freedom, the easier it is for the poor to rise up. The more freedom, the bigger the pie, even though there is no pie. The bigger the pie is, but the pie is created by making all of us better off. There's no other way, again, to grow that pie. So the solution to the real problems we have today are not in trying to redistribute, not trying to remake society, but to move us back in the direction where we started, where all this wealth came from, which is the direction of economic freedom, social freedom, the freedom to pursue our own lives, our own happiness, free of corrosion, free of authority, free of force. Thank you all. I'll take questions. Yeah. Hi. So you you started with the idea that um, in order to make an exchange, you know, it has to be mutually beneficial. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, but I, I think it kind of missed the broader point, which is why shouldn't we redistribute? Um, in order to establish that, you you have to prove what you alluded to later, which is that it prevents the pipe from growing. And I'm not convinced that that's true. For one, income inequality is increasing at a faster and faster rate, and it doesn't seem that correlated with growth. Um, in the second place, uh, income and wealth inequality. Um, in the second place, um, with wages in real terms aren't keeping up with, with productivity. Yeah. Um, growth since 1980 has not has not kept up with real wages, so yeah. you know, workers aren't sharing in the proceeds um, of whatever growth is happening. Um, so I, I feel like you maybe need to go further to establish that. Um, and then you, you kind of move on to this moral case yeah. um, where you talk about freedom. Yeah. And I feel like you haven't in any way justified why you're taking such a narrow view. Are the people, if you take a comparison in the US of like New York and um, Florida, for instance, um, in New York they have expanded Medicaid and, and they've made the, the ACA work for people so that people are less afraid of, uh, of changing jobs because they're afraid that they're going to lose yes. their health insurance. Do the people of New York really feel like they're less free? I don't think they do. Yeah, that's why if you look at statistics, uh, people are leaving New York. New York is a shrinking state, and Florida is a massively growing state. So if you judge success of states by movement of populations, then the population of New York is leaving because they're not happy there. And they're moving to places like Georgia and Texas and Florida where they are freer. So I think the best indication, it's like people say, how do you know Cuba, life in Cuba is tough? Because people are willing to swim in shark-infested waters to get out of there. That's how I know Cuba is not, you know, is not a good place. And I think if you look at population movements across state lines, you can figure out where people want to live and where don't they want to live. And generally, people are leaving California, they're leaving New York, they're leaving Illinois, they're leaving the old Northeast, which has that more status mentality and moving moving to areas where there's less of that. But but let me let me put that aside because you asked a lot of questions and there's a lot of content there. Let me try to deal with it in a more fundamental sense rather than you know the problem with America is it's not like Florida is capitalist and New York is socialist. It's like eh slight variations between them. It's not dramatic. So I'd rather deal with the dramatic differences uh, and then and then we can we can maybe do the subtleties. So the first question was um, okay, so I'm not trying to make a utilitarian argument, uh, although I could, right, because I think it works. I'm not trying to just say that um, a, a system that redistributes wealth is bad because the outcomes are going to be bad. I think that's true, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute. But I want to make a moral case. I think it's wrong, I think it's morally wrong for you to decide, for anybody to decide, how much wealth anybody should have and how much is appropriate to steal from them in order to give to somebody else. But why? Why? Because I think you have, I, I go back to the Declaration of Independence, I think you have a right to your own life. I think your life is yours. You get to decide what you produce, how much to produce, and what you produce is yours. You can then choose to give it away. You can choose to do whatever you want with it. So 
It goes back to the idea that I believe that your life fundamentally is yours and that force, any kind of force, all coercion is evil. That coercion is the anti-life, the anti-mind. And if you value the human mind and if you value individual human life, you should be against stealing. I, you don't make stealing legitimate by voting for it. It's just as illegitimate for a group to do something as it would be for an individual to do something. So that would be the moral point. Now let's let's take the economic point. And we can disagree about morality, it wouldn't be surprise me. Um, but economic point. What causes economic growth? And and we've got your economic teacher here, so we might disagree on this. But what do you think causes economic growth? What drives an economy? From a purely economic perspective. Consumption. Consumption, which is the classical answer. And yet in my view, completely wrong. Consumption does not grow economic growth. Now it grows GDP, but that's cheating because the way you measure GDP is you measure consumption. If you measure consumption, then the more consumption you do, the more consumption you'll get, which is what GDP is. But economic growth is not driven by consumption. Consumption is the final act. Consumption is an act of destruction. Consumption is when we eat the pie, and it's gone. And in order to consume, what must you do before you consume something? Yeah. Produce. Produce. So in order to have the money to buy the pie, I have to work. I have to produce in order to have money to buy the pie. That's one act of production. But somebody else has to work as well in order to produce the pie. So for every act of consumption, there's at least two acts of production happening. What drives economic growth is production. And it's sad that we don't measure it properly. The GDP is, is a flawed measure because it emphasizes consumption. And therefore, we think that the more government spends, the more consumption there is, therefore, the greater economic growth is. A theory that has been disproven over and over again. All you have to do is look at Japan over the last 40 years, where consumption, government consumption, has been massive. They've built infrastructure, they've spent money left and right, and yet economic growth has basically been zero. They've had three lost decades. What you need is to maximize production and make production as efficient as possible. And what is necessary for production? Savings. Savings are essential to production. Savings are future production. Because what do you do when you save? What happens to the money you save? What do, what do rich people do with their money? Hey, if savings are invested. Because if it just sits in the vault, like anybody seen Scrooge McDuck? I don't know if your generation is familiar with Scrooge McDuck. Scrooge McDuck like, likes to swim with his money, right? He goes into the vault and he swims in the money. It's not what happens, right? Rich people don't have a vault and they stuff all the money in the vault. They invest the money. They put it in the bank. What does the bank do with the money? How does the bank make money on when you put money in the bank? They have to lend it out to somebody who's going to use it, maybe for consumption, but mostly, most bank loans are for production. <coughs> so the way you grow the economy is through saving and investment. To save and invest. Who saves and invests? Well, wealthy people do. Middle class does. And you want, if you want to maximize saving and investment, you want to, you want to keep as much money in their hands as possible, because that's what they will do with it, which will then create jobs which will then create wealth, which all of us benefit from. So from a purely economic perspective, from a utilitarian perspective, absolutely. The reason we have slow economic growth is because we have such high taxes on wealth, on income, at the, at the top marginal rate. It's because we have regulated business to the extent that we have and controlled them and put them into these bo neat boxes and don't allow them to innovate and really produce. The, the only innovation we have today in the world is, is a, a, on this stuff. Because the government doesn't regulate it. And wait, because they're about to start regulating this heavily. And you'll see a dramatic reduction in innovation and technology over the next 20 years because the government is about to break up the big tech companies and about to regulate the tech companies. It happens in every field. As soon as they enter, progress declines. So, I think all the economic problems they cite, and let me, let me just say something about economic statistics, because it's, it's, it's fascinating to me. The whole question of whether inequality is increasing right now is not a, a closed deal. 
So if you actually look at the economics papers that are being published in economics journals right now, there's a lot of debate about the data that Piketty and other are using. There's a lot of debate about how to measure wages and whether, for example, benefits should be included in wages or not. Because benefits in the United States, because they're mandatory and the government has dictated them, have grown significantly. So wages might be stagnant, but if you add wages to benefits, they haven't been anywhere near as stagnant. So there's a lot of debate just about the empirics, where we hear in the media only one side of this, because there's a certain interest of it in only presenting one side. The whole question, I mean, even the, even the Financial Times, which I consider quite left, but even the Financial Times wrote an extensive piece on how the data that Piketty uses in his famous book about inequality is flawed and problematic. But there's been a lot of academic work on the issue of inequality that does not come out quite as easily as saying inequality has exploded. Because it's not obvious that it has. And again, how do we measure quality of life? What is it worth that in America, almost everybody has a smartphone, not an iPhone, but a smartphone. What's it worth that they have that? How do you measure the increase in quality of life that this makes possible? The time saving that this makes possible? It's, you can't measure it in wages. But now they can buy this where they couldn't buy it 20 years ago. How do you measure that? So there's a lot of issues and problems with wage data, inequality data, wealth data that is oversimplified in the way it's typically presented. Yes. Um, so just two quite small points. So, firstly, you said all coercion is bad. Yes. So, say, for example, I'm builder, and builder next to me, or not builder next to me, say, I'm drifting out of the sky, land on my foot, suddenly I can't work, I'm on the poverty line, I'm like, how am I going to leave food? So, that where did the brick come from? <laughs> well, it's a bad example, because the brick has to come from somewhere. Yes. So there's, there's but, but, say, for example, through no fault of my own, I get cancer. Like, yes. You know, cancer just around it, I get cancer, I can't yes. work anymore. Yes. I have to pay for expensive treatment. Yes. Isn't that a form of coercion and therefore bad? And no, well, because they're, 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 you're, you're, you're forced into that. You, you can't not. Metaphysical re reality can coerce you. So coercion, coercion is something only other human beings can do. A lion attacking you is not coercion. It is bad, and the brick falling from the sky and hurting you and you getting cancer is all bad. But we, there are different categories of bad, and one of those categories is coercion. Coercion involves other human beings. Forcing you to do something you don't want. So that's the, that's the that's the that's what coercion is. In, in terms of the material effect, though, that it's the same. Someone putting a gun to my head and getting cancer. Yes, it's absolutely, it's the same. But well, one involves choice, somebody's choice, and one doesn't. So I can I can't prevent you. I mean, I wish I could, but I can't prevent you from getting cancer. That is something beyond, you know, particularly if it's a genetic or something like that. That's beyond my abilities, right? But I can't prevent other people from putting it, and that to me is we create an institution whose job is to prevent people from hurting you, which is called the police, or we call it the law, that writes laws preventing from doing that. I can't have a law against cancer. So coercion, in the sense of somebody choosing to hurt you, that, I think, is always bad. Oh, and then the second, even smaller point, <laughs> was um, you said about Japan, they've had 30 years of stagnant growth. Yes. They've also had a falling population, and in fact, if you look at life expectancy, quality of life, Japan is amazing. Like, they live for ages, they have great lives, they have amazing ed education. Like, so I think it's kind of somewhat disingenuous to suggest that Japan is stagnating. Like well, okay, so even if you control for population shrinkage, it's, uh, Japan is the fastest shrinking population in the world. But, but they're very happy, they have long, long but You don't know lives. that they're happy, they're certainly not ha as happy as by happiness measures that Danes are, if you believe that, um, and I don't. But, 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 you know, you go to Japan and the Japanese are no more happy and don't seem to live and talk to Japanese and, than anybody else. I mean, this idea that, that this is some kind of idyllic society, I think, is, is wrong and dangerous, partially because they would say they're happiest because they, they're homogeneous and they don't have immigrants and they don't have people that look the same as they do. And there's all kinds of other reasons why they might, be, they might feel that way that maybe are not as pleasant for us to acknowledge. Uh, so I would be suspicious. I'd be suspicious of, of of the idea that everything is great in Japan because if you talk to Japanese people, 
They're complaining about lack of economic growth. They're complaining about lack of opportunities. They're complaining, and this is why they constantly try to create economic growth, right? I mean, the Central Bank of Japan is constantly trying to print money and lower interest rates and do all kinds of machinations to increase economic growth because they value it. Even if you fall far, think, oh, they live these idyllic lives. Um, I'm, I'm not convinced that that is actually the case. I'm really sorry. I'm going to have to stop you there. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you.